I'm going to start by talking about diagonalization, what it is uh, to begin with. Um, should be a familiar idea. This is everyone's favorite setup from linear algebra. So you've got a finite dimensional vector space over some field. And you've got a finite set of scalars, which I'm going to be denoting S, short for spectrum. Um, and you've got an operator F on V. And you can define the eigenspace to be um, the set of all vectors for which um, F acts by an eigenvalue. Very familiar. So um, when we have this setup, um, there's the notion of what it means for F to be diagonalizable, which is on the left-hand side, it's the idea that um, the vector space splits into eigenspaces. And when that happens, we say F is diagonalizable. On the other hand, you very often see, and because they're equivalent, people talking about the eigenalizability as saying that F satisfies a certain polynomial equation, um, a product of distinct factors, F minus lambda times the identity. Um, so I want to distinguish between these two concepts. They're equivalent in linear algebra. Um, it's a little bit more technical once you categorify. So I want to say that F is pre-diagonalizable if it satisfies this polynomial equation. And I want to say that F is diagonalizable if V splits into its eigenspaces. Um, philosophically, these are very different things uh, because checking that a polynomial, uh, checking that an operator satisfies a polynomial equation is a relatively easy thing to do. Um, but constructing a decomposition into subspaces is, is kind of, that's a lot of data, actually. Um, so uh, the, the, the diagonalization is typically what we want, but the pre-diagonalizability is the easier thing to check. Um, so there's a theorem in linear algebra that these are equivalent. Um, and one direction is easy. It's the other direction, which is the interesting direction, going from the easy thing to check to the useful state. And I just want to go into a little more detail on what it means to be diagonalizable. Um, so um, what does it mean for a vector space to split into subspaces? Um, in order for that to happen, you need to be able to construct projection to these subspaces. So there are going to be operators P lambda, which you should think of as the projection to V lambda. Um, and these P lambdas form a family of com a complete family of orthogonal idempotents. They're idempotent, they're orthogonal, and they sum up to the identity. Um, and of course, these three statements uh, would give you a statement that V splits into the images of the P lambdas for any arbitrary splitting. Um, but we want the image of P lambda to be inside the eigenspace. So if we argue, if we say that P lambda is itself an eigenvector, um, then anything in the image of P lambda is an eigenvector. And that gives you what you want. Um, so how does this? Um, theorem work, um, well, not only does it do these P lambdas exist, but they're actually a polynomial functions in F. They're polynomials of F. They can be constructed as polynomials of F. And the proof is to explicitly give those polynomials, um, which is done via Lagrange interpolation. So you're, you may or may not be very familiar with this, um, but I'll remind you later on when we categorify it. Um, so this is the theorem in linear algebra that I want to I wanna be spending most of, most of the lecture uh, categorifying. Um, but I first want to explain to you why you should care and, and, and why we're doing this. So diagonalization is useful. I just said that. Diagonalization is useful. Um, it's useful in probably every field of mathematics. But I'm a representation theorist, uh, so I want to tell you about some of the reasons diagonalization is useful in representation theory um, and my favorite things to use it for. Um, so here's one. Um, so if you have a, a, a finite dimensional representation of, say, quantum SL2, just to give an example, although any semi-simple algebra will work, um, then, uh, then this, is, this representation is completely reducible. It splits into simples. And in particular, it splits canonically into isotypic components. So in, in case you don't remember, an isotypic component is, is where you take, um, um, so, this is going to be the sum into all the isotypic components. You take one irreducible representation appearing with a large multiplicity, and this thing right here is an isotypic component. All the simples of all, all the simples of one given kind. Um, so splitting things into isotypic components is sort of a, a really useful thing that you can do in representation theory. And um, uh, in fact, you can do it using diagonalization. So, um, there is an element called the Casimir element in the center of SL2, in the center of this algebra. 
and it acts diagonalizably on a finite dimensional representation, and it has distinct eigenvalues on the distinct irreducible representation. So the, the eigenvalue on the irreducible representation with highest weight m is this thing right here. So consequently, if you diagonalize C, the eigenspaces are the isotopic components. So this is sort of a, 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 a philosophy and representation theory that isotopic components are the eigenspaces of central operators. Um, in fact, for any semi-simple algebra, you know, by Art and Wedderburn, if you simultaneously diagonalize the center, um, then the simultaneous eigenspaces are uh, the isotopic components. Um, here's another example of the same exact thing. And this is gonna be the example that I talk about next week in glorious detail. Um, but I wanna just introduce it to you now. So um, the Heck algebra of the symmetric group H um, is a uh, deformation of the group algebra of SN. You start with a group algebra of SN with its Coxeter presentation and you screw around the relations by adding some Vs and some VM bosons. And it's a quotient of the break group um, uh, for what it's worth. So um, the representation theory of the Heck algebra is just like the representation theory of the symmetric group. So the irreducible representations are in bijection with say conjugacy classes of the symmetric group or with partitions of N. And um, we'll talk about how you construct them um, next time. Um, now there is a central element which is called the full twist, FTN. It's the image of the full twist in the braid group, if that's your thing. And um, the, it acts diagonalizably as it should being a central element on, on any irreducible representation. And you can explicitly describe the, um, the uh, eigenvalues. So if you have a partition, so for instance, here's a partition of eight, four plus three plus one is eight. Um, then you can do the usual thing where you uh, label each box by which diagonal it's on, a zeroth diagonal, the first diagonal, and so forth. That's the content of the box. And you add up all the contents in all the boxes. In this case, you get the number four. And that's called the total content of lambda. And the eigenvalue of the full twist on, on that um, irreducible representation is V to twice the content of lambda. So um, this total content as a statistic is not quite enough to distinguish between all irreducible representations. So there are multiple irreducible representations, multiple partitions that have the same total content. Uh, these two right here are examples. Um, and, and of course, that's because we're only asking about one central element. If you diagonalize the entire center, then you can distinguish between different elements. So the full twist can almost tell representations apart. And diagonalizing the full twist is almost enough, but not quite. Um, OK, so that's my review of why you care about diagonalization in representation theory. Uh, and now, what should you expect from the categorification? So I'm going to be doing standard categorical ideas. I'm going to replace an operator with a functor. I replace the vector space with a category. I'm going to talk about how you replace eigenspaces with eigencategories. And so maybe you can bear with me. And if I say something like eigencategory, then maybe you can say, all right, I kind of vaguely know what that might mean eventually. Uh, I'll be defining those things later in the lecture. Um, but let's just figure out what, what sorts of things should be true about, um, about eigencategories or eigen, eigenvectors, eigen, eigenobjects or something like that. What, what might you expect? And I'm going to use, again, representation theory as a motivation. So categorical representation theory has already been pretty well developed, and we have a lot of theorems about how things work. So I'm going to use the structure of isotopic components in categorical representation theory to motivate what should happen for categorical diagonalization. So categorical representation theory sort of um, morally begins with this beautiful paper of Sean Riquier in 06, which defined what it means to be a categorical SL2 representation. And they, in that paper, they already gave an amazing structural theorem about all representations of SL2. So if you have a categorical representation of SL2, it is not a direct sum of isotypic categorical representations. Instead, there's always a filtration. 
there is always a canonical, they proved this, that there's a canonical filtration by subcategorical representations where the subquotients are isotypic. And, or the, where the subquotients categorify an isotypic representation. They also gave an explicit description of what isotypic representations look like. Um, but I'm not going to focus on that aspect. So um, the reason that you get a filtration and not a direct sum is because categorification is an inherently more rigid. You can't change basis. When you categorify, you are stuck with a basis, namely the basis of simples or the basis of indecomposables, depending on what setting you're in. So let me give you an illustration of what happened of, of this in an example. Uh, uh, yeah, early on I said V was finite dimensional. Um, and I'm not gonna state the right, I mean, in this theorem of Schoengrike, uh, it should be a finite, it should categorify a finite dimensional representation so the weights or spaces are bounded. Um, so here's an example. Um, this example can be constructed explicitly using uh, uh, equivariant uh, Pervasheves on Grassmannians, but let's not talk about that. Um, what is this picture supposed to represent? Um, each dot is a simple object um, in an abelian category, and there's raising and lowering functors, E and F. And when I apply them to a simple object, I do not get another simple I object. I get an object with a Jordan Holder filtration with a whole bunch of simples, each with multiplicity. So long as a simple appears with some multiplicity, I'm going to draw an arrow. So when I apply E to this simple on the far left, I'm going to get this simple with some multiplicity. And when I apply E to this simple right here, I'm going to get something which is built up out of these two simples with some multiplicity. Okay. Um, now, this is a representation of SL2, a categorical representation of SL2. And it's supposed to be the categorification of the tensor product of the three-dimensional IRAP with the three-dimensional IRAP. Um, now, you can see that if I take these simples on the top row, that um, sort of the Sayer subcategory, things built up out of these simple objects, is preserved by the raising and lowering functors, so that this forms a sub two representation. Um, but sort of there's no complementary sub two representation. The, the Sayer subcategory generated by these simples is not uh, preserved by ENF. So, um, in linear algebra, there would be a decomposition of this tensor product into a direct sum of three sum ends. And if you were trying to find the highest weight vector of this middle sum and here, it would be some linear combination of these two vectors that has a minus sign, okay? Because you need a minus sign for these sort of positive maps to cancel out and get zero. But unfortunately, no object in the Boolean category has a minus sign in it, right? It, is like a, it has negative copies of the simple. So you can't, um, expect there to be a highest weight category, uh, a highest weight object in the abelian category. Um, however, um, you can take minus signs in triangulated settings. Okay, so by using homological shifts, you can produce a minus sign. And this, the sort of, uh, I'll tell you the, the moral of that story in a second. But basically, here's what you might expect. So since you're not supposed to get a direct sum into isotypics, you're supposed to get a filtration, we should also expect a filtration whose subquotients are eigencategories. So the category we act on should not decompose into eigencategories, it should be filtered by them. Um, moreover, just like this highest weight vector, whatever it is, can't be categorified by an object in the original category, but it could be categorified maybe by a complex, because we need a minus sign somehow. Um, you should expect that eigenvectors are not usually categorified by objects, but maybe by complexes of objects. Uh, could you please explain the picture once again? So I don't understand actually how the E's are acting in the... Yeah, so I, I'm not giving you a complete description. So each dot is a simple. And um, when I have an arrow, so I've got an arrow from this dot to these two dots. So that says when I apply E to this simple, it's going to have a Jordan Holder decomposition, which is built up only out of these two simples and not any other simples. Uh, in fact, the crystal basis will tell you which, which, which one is the Sokol. So, so 
uh, this one right here is the Sokol. It, it, it is, uh, the Sokol is purely built out of this one. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's going to have a Jordan Holder decomposition built out of these two. Does that clarify the diagram? Uh, thank you, yes. OK, great. Um, and if you know anything about pervers sheaves, doing uh, this particular uh, example with pervers sheaves, I can explain it to you later, is, is, a, is, a, is a great one to learn the theory. Um, OK, so um, eigenvectors should be categorified by complexes. I, I think I did. Um, and uh, another thing about stronger case theorem is not just the existence of a filtration by, by isotopic components, but this filtration always comes in one order. The highest, highest weight appears as the sub, and the trivial representation of the lowest, lowest weight appears as the quotient. So what that means is that there's actually a, an, a partial order, or in this case, a total order, on the actual eigenvalues, which controls which order they appear in this filtration. Uh, a, to a partial order on eigenvalues is not really something you usually see in linear algebra, but this is something that really shows up as a new part of the theory in the categorical theory. Okay, so I said that isotopic components for SL2 can be realized by diagonalizing the Casimir operator in linear algebra. So is there a corresponding thing in categorification? So there's a, a nice theorem of uh, Belyakova Kovanovlada, which can explicitly constructs a complex which categorifies uh, the Casimir operator. And the fact that the Casimir is central also categorifies to the fact that the, this Casimir complex is in the Drinfeld center. It's like um, tensoring with anything on the right is the same as tensoring with anything on the left for this object. They're naturally isomorphic. So again, being in the center is now a structure, not a property. Um, but this is true. So sort of the Casimir operator is categorified in the best of all possible ways. And now we ask the big question, can we diagonalize the Casimir functor, the, the Casimir complex, to reproduce a filtration by Eigen categories, which is the uh, filtration given by um, Schrong Um And the answer to this question is right now, I have no idea. Um, this is like a really motivating question, and I can, uh, by the end of this lecture or, or by the next one, sort of you'll see what, what technology is missing and what needs to be done to solve this problem. But I think it's a really interesting, motivating problem. Um, so sadly, we're not up to the task for that yet, but at least um, in the HEC uh, algebra example, we can, do, we do have answers. So um, it's a theorem of myself and Matt Hogan camp that um, that the categorification of the full twist is categorically diagonalizable, and what that means will be explained. Um, so very, very briefly, there is a categorification of the Heck algebra. Uh, it's called Zergel bimodules. Um, you can take its uh, homotopy category, by which I mean category of complexes, where the morphisms are considered chain, chain maps modular homotopy, which is triangulated. Um, inside this, you have a complex, a Rukier complex associated to the full twist braid, and, and this, this thing is going to be categorically diagnosed. So we can use it to construct uh, more complexes, these capital P lambdas, which categorify the little p lambdas, and these will project, these are projections to isotopic components. Um, moreover, the monoidal identity of this HECA category is uh, filtered. Who's, and, with, and the subquotients are going to be these p lambdas. Um, so then, when I take this and I apply it to any object in, a, in, a, in an action, um, that says that m will be filtered by p lambda m. Um, so this this is sort of a proof that any categorical representation has a canonical filtration by isotopic components. Um, uh, there's actually one lambda, one eigenvalue for each partition of n. And that's unusual because downstairs I told you that the full twist doesn't have distinct eigenvalues for different partitions. The full twist cannot tell all partitions apart, but the categorified full twist can, and that's kind of neat. Um, so before going on, I just want to make one little plug here. So um, 
this theorem that a represent, categorical representation of the Hecke, Hecke algebra should have a filtration by um, isotopic components was already proven by Mazurchuk and Mimietz. So Mazurchuk and Mimietz, inspired by Schwang and Riquet's theorem, proved a whole bunch of absolutely general results about representations of monoidal categories. And it's a really nice theory. It takes a little bit of time to get into because there's a lot of extra sort of notation involved in dealing with two categories. But, um, but there's a lot of really elegant theorems that they, that they have, completely general theorems. Um, and so in particular, they already proved this fact about that. I just wanted to give a plug for this Masterchuk Mumiat's work. It's, a, it's been a, a really a lot of interesting stuff coming out of there. OK, so I'm going to start doing the actual talk now that you're all motivated after 20 minutes of motivation. Um, are there any questions before I continue? OK. So we want to categorify the theorem. Let me prove the theorem first. Um, so I want to explicitly construct a polynomial in F, which projects. I'm going to start by constructing this thing here, C lambda mu. Um, it's F minus lambda over mu minus lambda for two distinct scalars um, in the field. So this operator will certainly kill the lambda eigenspace because of the numerator. It will preserve the mu eigenspace because of the denominator. Uh, it will, sorry, it will act as the identity on the mu eigenspace. And it will at least preserve every other eigenspace. So if I do this for all the different uh, lambdas not equal to mu, then I will always be acting as the identity on v mu, and I will always and I will kill every other eigenspace one by one, and so I will get the projection um, to v mu. Um, so certainly this will work if v is diagonalizable. This should be the right formula. Um, now let me just like maybe as a mnemonic for how you remember it, C lambda mu is used, the second index is, is which projector it's used for. So C lambda mu is used for P mu, but it's built out of F minus lambda. So the first index tells you which, what the numerator is. So it's kind of, these things are gonna show up a lot. So some mnemonics are useful. So by the way, this is, this is a polynomial. If you wanna prove that it works, there's sort of a standard trick um, where a polynomial of degree d is determined by its values at d plus one points. And so in fact, these polynomials are determined by what they do at, uh, at the eigenvalues. And it's pretty easy to see what they do with the eigenvalues. So um, that's sort of the, the way in which one actually proves this, but I'm not so interested in this right now. I think it's better to move on. Um, I'll also mention that the proof takes place entirely in the algebra of endomorphisms of V. You don't actually need to talk about vectors at all. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about vectors. I'm just gonna switch my attention and think about algebras and things you can do purely within the context of algebras. Kind of a standard idea. Let's not talk about modules. All right, let's start categorifying. So instead of, um, instead of an algebra, I'm gonna have a monoidal category. Instead of an operator, I'm gonna have a, an object in A. And I, I think of it as a functor because I'm thinking about the functor uh, of tensoring with F. I, I identify F with the functor of tensoring with F. So I'm thinking if I say functor, I, I, I also mean object. Um, I, I'll give you my examples, but I think it, we need to talk first before I give you the examples that, I'm, that I have in mind. So to talk about eigenvectors, you need to talk about scalars. And um, Basically, you know, there's no definition of what a scalar functor is. Um, what we did in our paper is we said, well, here's what you could call a scalar functor, any subcategory satisfying blah. Uh, but, but for this talk, why don't you think about scalar functors as being shifts of the monoidal identity? So things that are built from the monoidal identity. If you're in a category with a grading shift and a homological shift, then you might take the monoidal identity shifted, and then you might take direct sums of these or something along those lines. Um, so when you take shifts, what they usually categorify are powers of V, powers of T, powers of some formal variables, the sort of standard idea in categorification. Um, because there's a lot of positive shifts, I'm just going to use, uh, uh, I'm going to use this uh, bracket to indicate the homological shift of by minus one, which actually moves a complex up by one in, in, in a homological degree. Uh, it's just a little bit more natural. Um, for examples. 
Okay, so what is an eigenvector? An eigenvector is a non-zero vector where f acts by lambda. Well, you might try to come up with an eigenobject, which is a non-zero object such that acting by f is the same as acting by some scalar functor, like acting by the identity, or acting by the identity plus the identity, or something like that. Um, this is a perfectly reasonable concept. I'm going to call it being a weak lambda eigenobject. And um, it makes sense, but it's not so useful. Um, so the, main, the, 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 the standard idea in categorification or in category theory is that you don't just say two things are isomorphic. Isomorphism is a structure. You should pick an isomorphism. Um, so that's the philosophical issue. Practically, though, um, because you didn't pick, pick, pick an isomorphism, um, this concept isn't functorial enough that the weak eigenobjects form a nice subcategory. They're not good enough to be called the eigencategory. Um, so you don't really want to deal with that. Instead, we want to come up with some better notion. How am I going to fix the isomorphism between F tensor M and lambda tensor? That's what I want to know. Um, here's a similar question. Um, so in linear algebra, M is an eigenvector if and only if uh, M is killed by this operator, F minus lambda. We already said that minus signs are tricky. So, so what is it that categorifies F minus lambda? Well, let me just talk about categorifying minus signs for a minute. So in a triangulated category, like a category of complexes modulo homotopy, there is a notion of a cone. Okay, so if you have two complexes, X and Y, and a chain map between them, then you can construct another chain complex, which is called the cone, and, it's at, and it lives in this distinguished triangle, like so. Um, so in particular, in the growth index group, the cone is equal to uh, the class of y minus, the class of a cone is class of y minus class of x. So just to remind you if, you, if you don't remember what cones look like, if you have xi going to xi plus one, going to y, going to xi plus two, and you've got, um, y i and i'm gonna shift x by one so x is in the wrong place and y is in the right place so i've got these two complexes i've got a chain map if i draw my chain map diagonally um then i can glue these together into a big complex so i take the direct sum of these two terms in each homological degree and i get a big complex this way this is the cone. Okay. Now, so you can think about this cone, sorry, you can think about this cone as being, you first take the direct sum of the two complexes, which would be what, you, what would happen if you didn't have um, anything in the middle, no diagonal maps. But then you change the, the differential, you twist the differential, you screw up the differential, and you get another complex, which is the same in the gross and group. It has the same order characters as the direct sum. So the takeaway is that there's more than one way to categorify a minus sign. Any map that you choose will give you a cone, and not all cones are isomorphic. Whenever you see a minus sign, you should immediately think to yourself, this implies that there should be some extra structure that I'm taking into, taking into mind um, in order to categorify that minus sign. Also, it suggests that we need to assume that A is triangulated in order to, do, uh, to, to, to have minus signs. So we're going to be working purely in the triangulated setting henceforth. So you should just think complexes of, of objects in a monoidal category. Why is x shifted by 1 minus x? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear what you said. Why is x shifted by 1 minus x? Yeah, whenever you have, um, uh, there's always a distinguished triangle. Um, in, a, in, a, in a triangulated category, there's always a distinguished triangle. x goes to 0, goes to x1, goes to x1. And so that tells you that ah. x plus x1 is 0. Ah, OK. That's sort of a. So shifted by 2 is x again? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I gave you two problems: how to categorify. Oops, sorry. How to categorify f minus lambda, and how to pin down this isomorphism, and they have the same answer. Here's the definition. So alpha is going to be a. Uh, you should think a natural transformation or a map in the category from lambda to f, and um, we call it m an eigenobject if when I apply alpha to m. I get an isomorphism. So alpha is sort of uh, a map just from lambda to f. M doesn't enter into it, 
but M is compatible with alpha. M is an alpha eigenobject if alpha, when applied to M, becomes an isomorphism. Um, and now, if you've got two eigenobjects, then there's sort of a natural commuting square that you can come up with, like the standard natural transformation square. So this will actually make all the eigenobjects into a nice subcategory. Um, uh, moreover, um, this, this idea in linear algebra that M is an eigenvector if and only F minus lambda is the identity, well, F minus lambda is categorified by the cone of alpha. And um, the cone of alpha, tensor M, this is your schematic for the cone of alpha, tensor M, is actually the cone of alpha applied to M. There's some compatibility between tensor products and cones in the context with which we're working. And the cone of a map is, is um, the cone of a map is zero if and only if the map is an isomorphism. So for this map to be an isomorphism, the cone tensor M is zero. These are equivalent statements. Okay, so that's the categorization of that idea. And I'll give you some examples very soon uh, on the next slide. But I want to point out that this is not the only, why, so why is alpha from lambda to f? Why is alpha not from f to lambda? Why don't I do some other complicated thing involving them? And the answer is you, you can, but this is just one theory. Um, I'm going to stick to this theory for simplicity. Um, OK, so how should you think about eigenmaps? You should think um, in linear algebra, you've got f and you've got lambda. <laughs> and um, and and but alpha the eigenmap you should think of as the relationship between f and lambda, but the relationship between f and its eigenvalue. It's not something that makes sense in linear algebra, but it's the kind of thing that makes sense in category theory. So, example one: if you don't know algebraic geometry, you can just close your ear, close your eyes for a minute. I'll get on. Uh, but if you know like the basics of coherent sheaves on projective space, then you should be able to follow this example. And it's such an important example that I felt like doing it first. So I'm going to do a very simple example next. Let me start here um, and, and do this because it's, it's inspirational probably for many people in the audience. So my monodal category is going to be the derived category of coherent sheaves on projective space, PR. Um, uh, my uh, functor F that I'm going to try to diagonalize is O1. And an example of an eigenobject for O1 is M, uh, the, a skyscraper sheaf at any point. Uh, I don't really care what kind of skyscraper sheaf you take, frankly. If you take a skyscraper sheaf at a point and tensor with any line bundle, the line bundle is locally trivial. So locally, you're, at a point, you're just tensoring with the trivial bundle, or you're tensoring with the monoidal identity. So any line bundle, tensor a skyscraper sheaf, gives you the skyscraper sheaf back again. Um, in particular, that's true for O1. So the eigenvalue in this case is the monoidal identity. Uh, here's a weak, it's a weak eigenobject. But maybe the question now is, which maps are eigenmaps? So a map from the eigenvalue to the functor um, is a section of O1. Well, it's like an element of, it's like a linear function on Pn. And when you, when you ask what happens after applying it to M, you're basically just taking um, the evaluation of that linear function at the point, which is just a number. And that number is sort of a map from this vector space to that vector space, if you will. Okay, multiplication by that number is what this map is. And that's an isomorphism so long as the number is non-zero. So so long as the point is not on the hyperplane where, where, the, where the linear equation vanishes. So almost every point gives you an actual alpha eigenobject, and the points that are on the hyperplane do not give you an alpha eigenobject. We'll come back to this example again later. Here's the main example for the talk. A is going to be the group algebra of uh, the cyclic group of order two. Um, so zx mod x squared equals one. Um, and we're going to be looking at A modules. Um, a modules is a toy, a toy example of the Hecke category in type A1. So this, this every work, all the work we're doing to develop this example is basically the work you need to do to study the Hecke category. Um, but it's a, a very accessible version of, of this example. Um, so here are some modules that we have. We have the regular module. Um, we've got the trivial rep, where x x by 1, and the sine rep, where x x by minus 1. And we're doing everything integrally. 
Um, now, as representations over a group, this category is monoidal. Um, the trivial rep is the monoidal identity. Uh, sign tensor itself is one. More interestingly, um, when you take A, the regular representation tensor with the sign is the regular rep. And the regular rep tensor with itself is two copies of the regular rep. Um, this gives us sort of a lot of, of weak eigenobjects. So for instance, um, S tensor A is, a is the same as identity tensor A. So S tensor A has eigenvalue one on A. Um, if I take one plus one in tensor with A, I get A plus A. So A tensor A is, is A plus A. That says that A acts on itself with eigenvalue two. Is it possible that any of these weak eigenobjects are actually strong eigenobjects? Can I find an eigenmap? No, I cannot. There is no map from the trivial rep to the sign rep that I could then tensor with A to get an isomorphism. There is no such map. Are there maps from one plus one to A? Um, I mean, there is a map from one to A, but there's only a rank one space of maps from one to A. So there's not like an injective map from one plus one to A. There's nothing that I could then tensor with A to get an isomorphism, okay? So these are examples of weak eigenobjects, which just simply cannot be upgraded to strong eigenobjects. And you should think that they're just not eigenobjects. <laughs> Tensoring with S uh, is not diagonalizable. No, eigenmaps are very much not unique. I was gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay. Now, I just want to point out that we're working over Z, so the category of mod representations is not semi-simple. I've got sort of the inclusion of the trivial rep in A, or X plus one is the polynomial, which is acted on trivially by X. Um, and the quotient by that is, well, X plus one is zero, so that's the sign rep. Um, and similarly, I've got the, the flip reverse sequence right here. These are non-split short exact sequences. But, and this is a standard fact about, say, Hopf algebras, um, uh, when you tensor with A, these sequences split. So when I tensor with A, I get A here, A here, and two copies of A in the middle. And since A is projective, it has to split. So now let's think about some objects in the homotopy category. Let's diagonalize something in the homotopy category. So if I look at this projection map from A to 1 that we saw in the previous slide, and I turn it into a two-term complex. Um, I'm going to call that complex G. And I'm underlining the term in homological degree zero. So the kernel of this map is the sign wrap, but it's just a quasi-isomorphism. It's not a homotopy equivalent. So in the homotopy category, this is, uh, this is not isomorphic to S. And I'm going to let F be G tensor G, which should be quasi-isomorphic to S tensor S, which is 1. So F is like, in, you should think of as a weird version of the identity. Um, I'm just going to do a little Gaussian elimination to, to give you the idea. So when I tensor together these two term complexes, I get a square. Um, but A tensor A is actually A plus A. And if you go through the isomorphisms and you choose the bases correctly, then these differentials are given by the following matrices. Um, that's, this is a good exercise for anyone. So this differential is an isomorphism between the first copy of A and the, here and the first copy of A here. And when you have an isomorphism as part of a differential, you can do this thing called Gaussian elimination, which chops off those two terms and returns a homotopy equivalent complex. And so here it is. So F is described more compactly. It's homotopy equivalent to this nice little complex right here. That's, that's a good answer. Okay, so let's find some eigen, eigen objects for F and G. I said that if I act on A, sort of this whole thing splits, right? So if I act by G on A, um, I get A tensor A goes to A. This was two copies of A. Well, this map is a, um, this map is a projection to one factor, and when you do homo Gaussian elimination, you just get back A itself. So um, A, G tensor A is A, and my eigenvalue is the identity with no shifts. And F tensor A, well, F is just G tensor G. So F tensor A is also A. So F and G both act on A with, with, um, with uh, 
eigenvalue one, and there's no eigenmap for G. There is no chain map from the monoidal identity to this complex. Like you can't construct a chain map because you can't do a map from one into A and back to one where the composition is, is zero. Um, the only chain maps are zero. But for F, it's all good. Um, yeah, the, the, the matrices do multiply to zero, hopefully, uh, because on the, on the trivial rep, uh, X, is, X is one. So X minus one is zero on the trivial rep. To answer the question that was in the chat. Okay, so F does have eigenmaps and we're gonna diagonalize F. So um, here we have a map from the monoidal identity to F. This time it works. This is the quasi-isomorphism I was talking about earlier. And when I tensor with A, I get a homotopy equivalence. Everything sort of splits nicely. So that's a good exercise. I'm gonna denote this map alpha sub column. Okay, so said another way, I can take the cone of this map. I'm gonna call it lambda sub column. So the cone becomes this four term complex here. I took a shift of this and I put it down there. And this complex kills A. All right. Do I have any more eigenobjects? Yes. So again, most eigenobjects are not objects. So I should stop looking for objects. I should look for complexes, complexes which are eigenobjects. And I already said that, um, that this cone kills A. So in fact, if I take F and I tensor with this cone, I have you know, A tensor, A goes to A goes to one tensor with the cone, the A terms die, I get zero. The identity gives me back lambda. And so I get back lambda, but with a shift up by two. So actually lambda is itself an eigenobject with eigenvalue, a shift of the nodal identity. And there's an eigenmap for this one too, which is just the isomorphism, including the last copy of the identity in this complex. I'm gonna call this alpha sub rho, rho instead of column. So I've got my two eigenmaps. And if I take their cones, I get this four term complex, or um, this two-term complex where the two copies of the identity cancel out under Gaussian elimination. I already said that this first thing kills A, and this second thing is, well, it's clearly built from copies of A. So if I tensor them together, I get zero. And this categorifies this pre-diagonalization polynomial. Okay? So. This sort of motivates what's going to, what the next definition of pre-diagonalizability. So my new notion of a something resembling a spectrum is I have a bunch of scalar scalar objects and a bunch of eigenmaps. Um, and I say that F is pre-diagonalizable if the tensor product of these cones is zero. Um, and I suppose usually you assume that no subset is, has the same property because otherwise you'd be throwing in extra eigenvalues for no good reason. So let's just finally make that minimality assumption. It's not relevant. Um, so an example would be uh, in this algebraic geometry example, if I choose any basis of sections of O1, um, the cone of a section of O1 is, is sort of, it, uh, is this sort of map, this two-term complex, and I take the tensor product of these, what I get is a giant cube, it's the causal complex. And this causal complex is supposed to resolve the place where all the, all the sections vanish simultaneously, which is the empty set in projective space since you've got rid of zero. Uh, you got rid of the origin in projective space. So this is supposed to resolve the origin, there is no origin. This is actually the zero complex. Um, and, and so this is an example of pre a pre-diagonalizable functor. Remember, pre-diagonalization is a structure, not a, prop not a property. So it's a bunch of eigenmaps satisfying this property. Um, and you can see from this example that eigenmaps are not unique. So in linear algebra, the spectrum of an operator is certainly unique. Its eigenvalues are fixed. But, 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 it, but in, in categorical linear algebra, any basis will do for eigenmaps. 
Um, no, because we're working over the Z to answer the question, sorry. Um, uh, so being an eigenvalue is a closed condition. F equals lambda on, an, on a vector. But being an eigenmap is an open condition. Being an isomorphism is an open condition, right? Um, and in particular, when eigenvalues repeat, like in the previous example, where all the eigenvalues were the monoidal identity, I can take linear combination of eigenmaps and get another eigenmap. So in fact, this is an extremely complicated situation. And because of this, like all of algebraic geometry kind of is a subclass of the theory of categorical diagonalization. So um, things can be very complicated when eigenvalues re repeat. Um, um, another complication is that in linear algebra, F commutes with itself and F commutes with scalars. So F generates a commutative algebra. Um, there's no guarantee that cones commute, which is kind of obnoxious. There's actually some homological obstructions um, to the commutation of cones. And we figured them out and we gave a definition of what it means to be, for some eigenmaps to be obstruction free, which is sort of the nicest possible case. And let me just say that there is such a definition and we'll go into more of this topic. So I better get to categorifying a functor before the end of the hour, right? Or before the end of the 50 minutes. Let's see how I can do. Um, so um, we have here um, this formula for how you construct a projector. And we want to categorify it. I'm going to categorify these little C lambda mu's. And I'll point out that in the case when there's only two eigenvalues, like in the case we were just doing, C lambda mu is equal to P mu. So we, we, like, we'll just focus on C lambda mu and deal with the case for two eigenvalues for the rest of this talk. Fractions, how do you categorify fractions? Denominators are a hard thing to categorify, but if we rewrite this denominator as a power series, it looks like this. So I've got this infinite sum of shifts, if you will. And how would I categorify that? So I've got right here, I've got, F minus lambda, which is categorified by the cone of an eigenmap. I've got a shift, and I've got this thing. Well, first of all, to even talk about any of this, my eigenvalues better be invertible. So I can't take one plus one. Something like a shift is OK, but I can't do this expansion if my eigenvalues aren't invertible. So something has to be completely differently done for the Casimir operator. I'll talk about that later. But, um, but a shift. Um, is totally fine. This is basically the, the understanding this argument here is the main limitation of our technology. So the naive way to categorify this power series would be to take the cone, um, take infinitely many copies of the cone with shifts, and take the direct sum. But again, there's more than one way to crack an egg. And, and one thing you could also do is twist the differential by adding some extra terms to make it more interesting. And voila. OK, sorry. That's the most boring way to do it. Here is a better way to do it. It turns out that with these shifts, I can exactly put alpha mu in here. I put minus alpha mu for technical reasons. But I can actually put alpha mu in here. It has the right grading shifts. And I can build a giant complex. So this, this is supposed to be a recipe for how to keep taking cones of cones of cones or how to twist the differential of a direct sum to get a complex. It's kind of like a double complex of complexes, and then you take the total complex. So let's do it in an example. So I'm going to construct C lambda mu. It's built up out of lambda, which is the first factor. So here's the cone of lambda. I'm going to take infinitely many copies of this and glue it together. So here's another copy. Here's another copy. Here's infinitely many copies. And I link them together with this alpha mu. Now, alpha mu is an isomorphism from the identity to the last term. So I can Gaussian eliminate these. And when I Gaussian eliminate all the ones, what I'm left with is just the a's. And I have this infinite complex 1 a, 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 a. That's C lambda mu. Not so hard. Does it work? Yes. Um, so since there's only two eigenvalues in this example, um, this is the projector. It still kills A. Um, and since it kills A, it's an idempotent. 
because when I tensor it with itself, all the A's die, and I'm just left with this identity at the end. Um, similarly, it is, um, it is an alpha mu eigenobject. Um, so it satisfies most of the properties we want. I'll just try to do one more minute or something and state the theorem. Um, if we try the same recipe with lambda and mu slot to construct the other one, we actually end up with a complex that's bounded below instead of bounded above. And you do not want a tensor complex is bounded below with complex is bounded above. You are doomed to infinite direct sums and, and that will make you sad. So basically the problem is that if we try to switch lambda and mu, we're expanding this power series in the wrong topology. We should expand it in, in mu, lambda over mu again, not in mu over lambda, right? If you wanna have an infinite power series make sense in a bounded above category, you need to take infinite sums of negative shifts, not positive shifts. So um, if instead you use a different power series expansion, which makes sense in the same topology, and you sort of do a, a similar sort of idea, which categorifies that infinite direct sum, then now you get a complex which is bounded above and looks just like the complex before, but without the identity in front. So here are our two projectors. Um, this one is built up out of A. This one kills A, and so their, their tensor product is zero. And you can see that sort of this one appears inside that one. So if I take the quotient by the subcomplex here, I get from here to here. So there's actually a, uh, short, a distinguished triangle right here, which categorifies this orthogonal, the fact that they add up to the identity. So this is the filtration of the identity by orthogonal item points, which I discussed. But you can really see it. Um, ignore this slide. Um, let me point out that if they had the same homological shift, I couldn't expand it in either topology so I would be utterly doomed. It's important for me to do this construction that I don't have infinite direct sums. Um, and as a result, I need to assume they have distinct homological shifts in order to crank this machine. So um, let me be brief and I'll do the rest of this next week. I purposely planned too much. Um, um, F is diagonalizable, categorically diagonalizable. If I can build projectors, which are idempotents, they're orthogonal, they're, they're eigenobjects themselves, and there's a filtration of the identity um, by, uh, um, by whose subcomplexes are these P lambdas. And our theorem, our theorem is that if you have a functor and you have, um, it's pre-diagonalizable and all the shifts are, um, are invertible and they each have distinct homological shifts and it's pre-diagonalizable, then we can construct these projectors and these cones basically just as I described to you and the result will be a diagonalization. So I'll talk more about that next time. Sorry, I went over. Great, thank you so much, Ben. Um, um, <laughs> so does anyone have any questions for Ben? Um, any questions? Um, can you talk more about the example of equivariant perverse sheaves? Um, about equivariant perverse sheaves? Um, how do uh, how do equivariant perverse sheaves on a cross mine categorify the um, Tensor product. Right. Yeah. Um, let me just write it down on the appropriate slide here. Um, yeah. So, what is the um, the category I'm I'm looking at? Um, the I'm going to take um, Grassmannians in four space, and I'm going to take sort of the two by two block parabolic, and I'm going to take um, uh, p equivariant perverse sheaves on the Grassmannian of zero planes in, in four space, p equivariant perverse sheaves um, on the Grassmannian of one planes in four space, and so on, up to four planes in four space. And this category, well, I mean, this is a point, right? Grassmannian of zero planes in four space. So there's gonna be one perverse sheaf, the constant sheaf, and this, this simple perverse sheaf corresponds to um, this 
simple right here. There's two or p orbits on this space, and so there's two perverse sheaves, and they correspond to these two simples right here, and so forth. Um, and then there's sort of uh, your sort of standard sort of partial flag variety, where you take a zero plane inside a one plane inside a four plane with two forgetful maps, mm. or a, a line inside a plane inside four space with two forgetful maps, and pushing and pulling along this is what gives you E and F. Um, ben, we have a couple of qu or three questions in the, in the yes. chat, so I'm just going to read them out so that everyone can see them. So Aaron Maisel G asks uh, if the, so these cone alphas are always idempotents. Yeah, so not quite. Um, in fact, no. Um, so in this example, um, for instance, um, C lambda mu is an idempotent, um, but, but the cone itself is not. The cone itself is this four-term complex. Um, and you know, maybe if I go back to the cone, where is the cone? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So here's an example of the cone right here, this four-term complex right here. And this cone kills A. So if I tensor it with itself, um, the two A terms do nothing, but I have two identity terms. And so I'm actually going to get two copies of itself. So this thing is not an idempotent. F minus lambda is not an idempotent. F minus lambda divided by mu minus lambda is an idempotent. And mu minus lambda here is something like two, right? So F minus lambda divided by two would be an idempotent. If I square it, I get twice itself. And then uh, Monica uh, is asking, what do you mean by tight? What do you mean by tight? So some slides that I skipped over from time. Um, let, me, let me explain. So um, in, in linear algebra, um, so I gave this statement that like what I needed is for P lambda to be an, eigen, an eigenvector. And if P lambda was an eigenvector, then the image of P lambda is the eigenspace. Well, the fact that P lambda is an eigenvector formally just implies that the image of P lambda is inside the eigenspace. But since V is a direct sum of, of the images and eigenspaces are orthogonal to each other, you can conclude that, well, anything in the eigenspace must be in the image of P lambda because it's not in the image of anything else. Um, so you can deduce um, that V lambda is in the image, but this is completely false when you categorify. So um, when the, the definition of categorically diagonalizable I gave at first um, with no extra conditions implies that, that everything in, in the image of P lambda is an eigen object, an alpha eigen object for this particular map, but it doesn't imply that every eigen object is in there. Or said another way, it doesn't imply that if M is an eigen object that P lambda fixes M. It could send M to a different eigen object. Okay, P, the image of P lambda could be a subcategory. And um, so in particular, it's completely possible for eigen categories to overlap but P lambda would project away from these things because P lambda and P mu are orthogonal. So this happens in the algebraic geometry example because remember that in the algebraic geometry example, a point is an eigenobject for almost every basis section. You know, like, so if you choose a basis of, 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 of your sections of, of O1, then any point not on any of those hyperplanes is an eigenobject for all of them, okay? Um, but when you, when you take uh, the projection, this projection being the cone of this section is sort of supported on, on the hyperplane. Um, so uh, so um, anyway, um, sorry, supported away from the other hyperplanes. Um, anyway, so, so it doesn't work in, in that example because eigen, maps, eigen, eigen categories overlap in that example. So you call a diagonalization tight, if in fact um, P mu kills V lambda or equivalently P mu preserves mu eigenobjects or equivalently blah, blah, blah. Everything works the way expect, expected to from linear algebra. And, and um, this will come uh, as part of our construction um, because P mu is built up out of the cones of some other things and so automatically it kills the other eigenobjects. Um, but it, it implies that something really subtle is happening. Um, and, and you actually need to do a lot more work. Um, the, uh, the interesting um, sort of, the interesting related thing is that all these problems in geometry 
in this example of projective space go away if you do torus equivariant um, coherent sheaves on projective space. Um, so in that case, you can't just take any structure sheaf of a point because it won't be torus equivariant. You can only take structure, you can only take the fixed points um, under the torus action if you want a, the skyscraper sheaf. And all those fixed points lie on a bunch of hyperplanes. So, so there's sort of no, um, there's going to be no counterexample to this problem. And the diagonalization ends up being tight. Thank you, Ben. Um...